if you look at the back, if you see my embroidery projects, like they look very pretty. And then you look at the back and you're just like, oh, okay, this is sin. <laughs> this, is, this is what sin looks like. And you just like try to turn away from it. Rusty Quill presents Enthusiasm. Friends and fans, and welcome to Enthusiasm, the show where we talk about a few of our favourite things. I am your host, Helen Gould, one of the best Rusty Quillers, and today we're talking about crafting, and I am bedazzled to be joined by Jess and Reese. So, as always, we are going to introduce ourselves alphabetically, so that means, Jess, you are going First, can you tell me your pronouns and what you do? Hello, my pronouns are she, her. I'm Jessica Law and I'm a a writer and singer-songwriter. And I was also the voice of Nikola Orsinov in the Magnus Archives. Yeah, you were. Ah, a lot of fan enthusiasm for that one. <laughs> it was great. It's weird. <laughs> it was just two afternoons in a very busy year and I've been living off it ever since. <laughs> Fantastic. And Reese, what are your pronouns and what do you do? I go with they, them pronouns and I'm the tech assistant at Rusty Quill, the writer at Nemesign Podcast. And gosh, I do way too many things in my personal life. I'll just leave it at that. That's fair. That's fair. I often have a similar problem. (laughs) All right. So we're going to start off with the obvious question. Can each of you tell me about your specific crafting hobby? And let's hear about how you got into them. Does anyone want to go first? I don't mind going first since we're alphabetical. (laughs) My hobby in craft is almost exclusively hand sewing historical costumes and cute critters. Oh! Yeah, uh, (laughs) it's not as glamorous as it sounds. I mean, it is literally glamorous. Some of the costumes are quite literally glamorous, but they're horribly made. (laughs) I got into cute critters first when I was about seven or eight, and it's because my mum wanted me to stop nagging her to buy me toys, (laughs) because I always wanted the latest toy, and, you know, she couldn't afford it, and she was just like, just make your own. And she taught me how to make cuddly toys and I went wild with power and <laughs> I proceeded to I proceeded to sew 50 pigs in a row. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> a little pig army. Yeah, 50 pigs because I just felt omnipotent. It was amazing. Like I, I was drunk with power. <laughs> And um, and I kept them in a little sty. I made a little sty with like little fence, and, and I made I made a furby. Oh. It was like a beanie furby. I used lentils for the beans, and I made it out of these these beautiful grey marl woolen socks. So it looked like a kind of tabby pattern. Mm. And I made a Pikachu out of a yellow towel, even though I didn't know what what a Pikachu was. <laughs> But yeah, <laughs> I wasn't into Pokemon at all. I just, I just wanted a Pikachu. And I took them to school and it was really interesting because my friends were really divided. And well, I say friends, my classmates were really divided. And half of them were like, oh, Sado, you've got to make your own toys because you're so poor. Oh. And then the other half were like, you're so talented. I think this is really cool. And it was just, (laughs) it was really divisive. And then I got into historical costumes because really the way that you construct clothes, they're a teddy bear without the stuffing. (laughs) So you just make a giant teddy bear and don't bother to stuff it. And we're basically all just wearing the empty husks of unfilled teddy bears, just just the skins of cuddly toys on us all the time. So it was, it was quite a simple transition, really. I see. You you are rapidly climbing the ranks of my favourite guest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you say that now. Um, <laughs> this is amazing. So, Reese, what do you craft and or make, and how did you start doing it? Uh, that is, I, mm, okay. It's kind of like a long 
story, the fact that I even cr- started crafting. We've got time. I've only got the two guests. You can go wild. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So when I was in like middle school, I, I don't remember like which one of my friends it was but i remember walking like it was like lunchtime or whatever so i was like walking down the hall and i see um i peek into one of the classrooms and it's just like my one friend like sitting there and like the teacher is also sitting there like eating her lunch like whatever and my friend was like literally knitting and i was just like word (laughs) this is something we can just do like no one's gonna like call the cops on i don't know For, for some reason like things they were like Things that you could do for lunch and then things people didn't do during lunch. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if it's because we weren't allowed to do it or if it's because we just didn't like thing to do it. So I see my friend knitting and I was just like, we can just do that. (laughs) So I started like, you know, I I started knitting with her. She, She let me borrow some of her knitting needles and I got like some yarn and then... I would go home to my mom. I was like, mom, I want to start knitting. I need knitting needles and and yarn. And she's looked at me and she's like, who is this weird ass kid? (laughs) And so like, I just like started knitting. I didn't do anything but knit like scarves because that's like the most basic thing you could ever knit. But it was like the only thing I started knitting. And then literally the year the the panoramic started, Mm. you know, the panini. Yep. All the other P words. Old patty pants. Yep. Yes. The, The year that happened, I was you know, being home all the time, I was like, you know what would be fun to pick up? Embroidery. And so I picked up embroidery. And also because I guess I wanted to know what it's like to live in the 1920s. I was like, let me listen to a podcast while doing embroidery. I will be the 1920s, like old maid who's just listening to the radio, etc. Just kind of like going hard at this like embroidery thing. I I asked my friends, what should I listen to? And they're like, you need to listen to the Magnus archives. And I was just like, sure, whatever. And then I listened to it, and then I was like, I want to work here now. And then I applied, and I got here. So that's the story of how I came to Rusty Quill, because I just, you know, I started embroidery. embroidery. (laughs) And then the year after that, so last Christmas, I... Actually, no, it was the same year. I remember this because my parents were very upset with me. We do this thing where we trade Christmas lists... Hmm. just to make it easier on ourselves because sometimes you know we're just really difficult to shop for Hmm. so i was just like oh get me a sewing machine i would really love a sewing machine and they're like what do you need a sewing machine for and like me i was in my mind i was just like i want to be the best nerd i can be and just make cosplay but i can't tell them that because then they won't buy it for me (laughs) so i told them you know it's a good it's it's you know it's a good thing to learn to sew and to fix clothing and they bought it and Hmm. i was like (laughs) psych (laughs) I'm just getting I'm just gonna make cosplay so now I have a sewing machine and currently I am I have I have linen yarn not yarn fabric like stuffed away in my closet because I am planning on making like so I want to go to a renaissance fair oh sometime in this lifetime so I want to make a specific like dress and like maybe a skirt because there's this one uh, shop on Etsy that like has this really cute like corset that I want you know wear with it so I'm just like all right I just need you know I have the fabric I can sew this together and then I'll just buy the corset and then that'll be it that'll be my renaissance fair outfit so that's what I'm attempting to work on whenever I actually get to it I have the fabric I have the sewing machine I just need the time to sit down and work on it wow I could send you the pattern that I made mine with please do oh my god please do yeah I'll I'll have a look at it. I'll see whether it... I might have completely destroyed it <laughs> by cutting it out all wrong. But I need patterns. I'll, I'll have a look and I'll, I'll see whether I can, I can uh, salvage something. Please do. So if anyone listening to this hasn't, hasn't picked up on it yet, I probably have ADHD because I just kind of run around deciding, you know what, this will be, this will be nice to learn. And then I learn it and then I move on to something. It's never one thing. It's always just <laughs> at some point in my life... I decide this would be cool to learn and then I pick it up and I'm obsessed with it, with it for like three weeks mm. and then I moved on to the next thing. Oh, that's the glory of it though. Yeah, no, I still like embroidery and knitting. I, it's just, I currently, my thing is I need to create this Renaissance Fair outfit because I've never <laughs> been to a Renaissance Fair <laughs> and I really badly want to. Do you know, I don't really know if we, if we have Renaissance Fairs here in the same way that you do in the States. Really? Because like... Well, like I feel like y'all are like the OGs about it. Like we have medieval reenactment reenactments, but it's not really a a fair as such, huh? Oh, there's an amazing medieval fair in Ludlow, really. And yeah, my cousin once drank too much mead 
and went up to a stallholder and asked if they sold runcible spoons and then ran away giggling. <laughs> so that that's the sort of indicative of the level of jollity that there was going on there. <laughs> I had no idea. I thought we just did like battle reenactments yeah. and castle tours and things. No, no, there are medieval fairs, ah. and I think they are actually the same thing as Renaissance fairs. They're just called something different. Huh. Interesting. Um, well, it's a slightly different era, but yeah, they're, and they're really good. They, they're what they are. I think the same thing. There's like acts on, like jugglers and music mm. and all that sort of thing. Giant turkey legs. I'm not sure about that. Never seen one walking around with a giant turkey leg. Is it a renaissance fair if there isn't a giant turkey leg? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to just, like, take a bite out of a giant turkey leg and then just throw it over my <laughs> shoulder and have greyhounds eat it off the floor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, love to be a Disney English king. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so we've got knitting and embroidery. We've got cuddly toy making and dress making, it sounds like. Well, all sorts of things, really. Costume making. Trousers, yeah. <laughs> even a shirt. And I once made a hat, don't you know? <gasps> I was able to create a few cosplays, um, like sewing wise. So one of them... Oh, so I really like the Owl House. So I sewed like the crop top that, what's her name? Oh my God. I know her name because I've cosplayed as her so many times. <laughs> I've never seen the Owl House. I wish I could help, but. <laughs> Luce, that's her name. Because she has like this, this crop top hoodie that's like half purple and then like half white on the bottom. And then she has a hood that has like these cat ears on it. So I had to make that myself and I was, so I made it myself out of fleece for a very specific reason. I made it out of fleece because mm -hmm. when I go to comic cons, I get cold very easily. Fleece is very good for like trapping body heat and stuff. So I was like, yeah. I'm going to make it, you know, I'm going to go to comic con. It's going to be great. And I was right about that because I was cold. It helped very much to keep me warm in, at comic con. But I was also upset because the reason why I made it was because I couldn't find anyone online who just made it themselves and was selling it. So I was just like, oh, okay, I guess I'll have to make this. Mm. And then I go to Comic-Con and I see like five other looses with like, you know, generic shirt. And I was like, where did you even get that? And I was like, oh, they're selling it on Amazon. And I was like, so I made this for no reason. <laughs> I went out of my way. Like I had to... No, it, I was so upset. It's better. Is it? It's better that you made it. You you can be proud of it. Yeah, it's you've got the added kudos. <laughs> no, because I made it wrong the first time. Oh, can I ask how you made the cat ears? Because that seems hard. That wasn't actually too difficult. So that was another pattern that I just like got off the internet. So there's like a strip on top of the hood um, that you just cut off first, and then you have the cat ears and you sew it like kind of flat on the head. And then you bring back the strip that you cut off and just kind of like fold it over. Because you, when you make a hood, you actually use, I'm going to say between two or four pieces, depending on like how you make the hood, two mm. or four pieces of fabric. Usually I like to cut the hood in half, like from right and left side. So you need to actually double that for the inside of the hood because you're you're sewing like the inside and yeah. Of course. Once you pretty much like sewed back on that strip, then you can just sew it to the inside of the hood and uh, it, it stands up when you actually put it on. Wow. Yeah. Fleece is very thick. And if you have like four layers of fleece to like sew through, it beca it becomes very <laughs> difficult, which is why I was upset that I expended so much energy to make this, this hoodie. <laughs> when I went to Comic-Con, I was like, I could have just gotten this at Amazon. Like I could have. <laughs> why did I do this? Why did I put in all this work? Why did I suffer trying to get like the little knots out of my sewing machine? <laughs> I love sewing, though. <sighs> this is genuinely like, sewing. this is like listening to people talk about magic or something to me, because I am terrible at doing anything with my hands. I can just about hit a nail with a hammer. And even then, I will not have measured it correct. There is a particular picture up above my TV that I am just lucky that the direction I got it wrong in is the direction that is covered by the picture. There is like... Eight different holes in the wall <laughs> because I did not measure it correctly. And I was like, that looks like it'll be about level. And it wasn't. 
It wasn't at all. Well, you could just use the holes in the wall to do some cross stitch. <laughs> I really don't think that's how cross stitching works. And I'd be bad at that too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've, I've heard that holes are involved. But I, it is wonderful. It is it is like being omnipotent. <laughs> it's just like you see something and you either can't get hold of it or it's expensive or something. And then you just think, I shall make this. And it... I mean, I think that, especially with clothes, like the clothing industry should make clothes for everyone. Yes. Yeah. But it does democratise clothing somewhat because you can just, mm. if it doesn't exist, you can make it yourself and, and it's really freeing in that way. And you can adjust things as well. Like, I don't think I own a single item of clothing that I haven't adjusted in some way, mm. which means I can buy stuff I wouldn't normally buy like I just buy a load of stuff from charity shops and then dismantle it and remake it the area I'm from is just really good for fabric but I also just I know a lot of people with just loads of old fabric lying around <laughs> from curtains or bedspreads or like you can just go into a charity shop and buy an old <laughs> tablecloth or something I made some horrible checked golfing trousers <laughs> out of a sort of plaid tablecloth and uh, dismayed the world with them. I felt quite proud. <laughs> okay, well, on that note, I want to ask a question about, do either of you have like a favourite thing that you've made? Like a thing that you look at and you're like, yes, this is the epitome of my creativity is in this. For me, it would, it would definitely be another bit of cosplay I made because I finally, I made it the perfect size for myself because okay i love oversized hoodies mm. so much because it's just easy to put on take off like it's very good so one of my friends is um he's a comic book creator the comic book he writes is a uh, he he draws actually and writes is sweetie and i think it's like published through like action labs and sweetie is like this i want to say she's in middle school like she, she gives off middle school vibes and she's <laughs> just like this little black girl with like this white and purple hoodie that like has some glow in the dark features to it and like these pink wings on the back. Aww. And I was just like, oh, I'm going to cosplay her. And my friend was just like, oh, like he's like tears streaking down his face. He's like, if you do, I need you to come with me to cosplay to, to Comic Cons, like dressed as her while I'm selling the comic books. And I did that. So Aww. the first year I didn't do so well at like creating it. I just it was a bad one, but it was my first cosplay. Mm. And then when I got my sewing machine, I like it was like I leveled up. <laughs> then I could like I'll, all I needed was the fabric. I needed like maybe some paint. And, like, then, like, getting the ribbing. So I had never used, like, ribbed fabric before, and so I was very nervous about it. It's like, you know, the edge of, like, the cuffs of your hoodies or, like, you know, the yeah. edges of on the bottom. So I was always, like, very nervous. It's like, oh, my God, I have to make sure that this gets sewed in properly. So I would be, like, looking at, like, so many different tutorials. I was like, I need to get this done right because if it's not done right, I'm going to cry and I will never sew again. Oh. But it came out fine. So I was like, okay, great. And it was so – it was oversized, which, like, made it even better. Like, I could put the hood on with no problem. The character also has, like, a massive afro. So I was worried about the hood not fitting over my specific afro. Mm. But it was great. And so, like, it is – for right now, it is, like, my favorite piece of cosplay that Aww. I've ever made. I think that's lovely. <laughs> Jess, what was yours? You said you'd, you had one, but you changed it. I had one, but I've changed my mind. Oh? Because the, there's one where I, I sort of realized I'd leveled up. <gasps> but then there's one that I just like more. Tell us about both of them. Why not? The one I realized I'd leveled up was this shirt. Wow. Because – it it's like it's a proper shirt and it's got buttons buttonholes mm. it's got a collar it's got cuffs it's got you know buttons on the cuffs and i just thought that things with buttonholes and collars and and things like it was some secret magical technique that was sort of beyond me but when <laughs> when you actually just very slowly and ploddingly follow the instructions it, mm. it's just fine there's no like secret formula and i really enjoyed making this because i i sew exclusively by hand mm. because i feel like i have a lot more control <laughs> over what happens it doesn't just run away with me let the record show that reese is astonished and awed i can't sew by hand at all <laughs> if i need something sewed by hand i take it to my grandma i can't sew on a machine at all it's too 
it, it, I can't control it. It doesn't obey. But yeah, so I actually mm. did. Oh, you probably can't see this, but I did hand sewn buttonholes what? using historical techniques. Can you describe the shirt for the listeners who cannot see your webcam at the moment? <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's an Edwardian style paisley shirt with sort of stripes and paisley patterns, got a rounded collar and long sleeves. It's got like a proper, not going to use too much jargon, <laughs> I did hand sewn buttonholes so there's lots of really tiny little stitches around the buttonhole and it's done in such a way that it's there are like little knots on the inside of the hole so it's really strong so when the button goes in and out it doesn't get worn out it's using i think it's sort of since the tudor times and the collar it's got all the layers that the, the collar's meant to have i don't know i was just proud of it you should be that is so cool i yeah i know i was quite surprised actually and you know what Sometimes it's the simple things that you've got to look out for because you mm. get complacent and then you don't pay attention and then it turns out dreadful. Um, it's got slightly puffed sleeves um, with little darts at the top in the Edwardian style, which uh, hardly anything does nowadays. Yeah, I once bought a velvet jacket and just chopped the whole thing up and made it have puffed sleeves because it didn't have them. <laughs> You demanded puffed sleeves. Yes, I demand <laughs> puffed sleeves. As a citizen, it is my right to have puffed <laughs> sleeves. <laughs> then what was the other thing that you really liked that you're proud of? Oh, oh, yeah, I'll have to get it out of the wardrobe very briefly. This is a 1960s Mary Quant style mini dress. Oh, wow. That I made from a pattern that was available for free on the Victoria and Albert Museum website. You should definitely look it up because they do fashion exhibits and they often do free patterns inspired by the designer that's being exhibited at the time. Mm. And then the the fabric that it's made out of is actually, it's meant to be some crocodile cushions for, a, a, I imagine, for a children's nursery. <laughs> but instead, I just, it's got these huge crocodiles on it that you're probably meant to cut out. I see. Yes, yeah, so see, there's its its head, and then there's there's the front of its head, and there's the back of its head, and you're probably meant to cut them out and sew them into mm. a crocodile. But I just use it's just I love it. It's so psychedelic <laughs> and outrageous, and I think it's more like the time than people think it. What well, mm. it's hard to explain. It's more, it's not like the stereotype, but it's more like the, how they actually were, like that w really random weirdness. Mm. Yeah, it looks really authentic to me. So it's like green and orange, two massive green and orange crocodiles on a blue background with like a pink collar and uh, it's a sleeveless little mini dress. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so proud of it. And I actually managed to look quite good in it, which is... um quite difficult with the lurid um, <laughs> pattern but that's so cool you're both so cool <laughs> i am not i just like nerdy stuff jessica's over here like i do everything properly by the 1700s whatever and i'm just like i wish i were you right now i wish i knew things no no it's if you look on the insides of the clothes they're an absolute horror show honestly <laughs> Isn't that how it is all the time, though? Because, like, if, if you look at the back, like, you yes. see, like, if you see my embroidery projects, like, they look very pretty. And then you look at the back and you're just like, oh, OK, this is sin. This is, this is what sin looks like. And you just, like, try to turn away from it. It's always the inside that you're just like, I don't want to look at this. Let me look at the, the very pretty outside. You know, it's, it's, it's fine from the outside. Well, I think all crafters are cool because... It's it is cool to do craft because it gives you power to create things and and to be creative and being creative is by definition cool. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. And on that, we're going to take a little break and we'll be back in a second. 
Hello everyone, this is Helen, the voice of Azu from Rusty Quill Gaming and host of our chat show, Enthusiasm. If you haven't heard yet, Rusty Quill has a brand new original audio drama, Trice Forgotten. Trice Forgotten is a swashbuckling found family adventure created by Nemo Martin. Alestes likes to keep her head down while she works as a merchant, couriering deliveries and carrying travellers to destinations across the seas. Only, as her travellers gradually become permanent crewmates, she realises her ship has become a floating museum, a laboratory, a vault of repatriated treasures and a chef's kitchen. After spending most of her life with the understanding that nothing changes, no matter how hard you fight, Alestes is faced with a choice. Will she use her new network of allies to build a safe harbour and potentially a future for her new community, or will she once again put her head down and drown in her sea of excuses? Trice Forgotten is the latest audio drama from Rusty Quill, creators of multiple award-winning podcasts including the Magnus Archives and Rusty Quill Gaming. Search for Trice Forgotten, that's T-R-I-C-E, wherever you listen to your podcasts or visit www.rustyquill.com for more information and welcome back okay so the first half of this episode was all about what amazing talented creative people you are so now i want to hear about like the worst thing you've ever made just tell me about like when you absolutely failed to make something because i bet there's some really funny stories in here like tell me about the the scarf you made that would only fit a giant or something. <laughs> I have a failed specimen here. A failed specimen? Yeah. It's a Tudor hat and there's something about it. Oh, it's so round. It might be. It's it's too round <laughs> and there's something about it that's just not right. And I think it's because I've got a small flat head and when I wear it, it's too big, it's too floppy and it looks like a dinner plate. Jess, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to be laughing at you but the way you just put it on. No, you're meant to because this is a failure. This, it just, do you see what I mean? I'm glad you see what I mean. I'm glad you're laughing because it doesn't work. Like it doesn't. I feel okay. <laughs> That could very work. easily be like on like one of the costumes for any of the Alice in Wonderland characters. Mm. It could very easily work in those situations, though. Yes, it could. The problem is it's meant to be an authentic Tudor hat. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like a deranged sort of <laughs> giant novelty hat because I've got a minuscule head. And I got some iron-on interfacing and I was really excited about this interfacing and then it was too thick and it's just like a, a dinner plate and it's dreadful <laughs> and I hate it. And I I just made it and then I didn't even post a picture of it on social media because people would just say, like, oh, it looks like this, it looks like that, the thing that it isn't. Like, I'm really insecure about the things I make and like Oh Jess. Once I made a dress I, I thought looked like a Regency ball gown. And I put some pictures online and then everyone was saying, Oh, it looks more like an Edwardian <gasps> ball gown and I was just <laughs> Glorious. And I was like, I spent days on this. It doesn't look like an Edwardian pole gown because it's different. And, it, and, and I just, and like, I was just, I know people would say that this looked like a Georgian mob cap if I posted it. And I just, I can't take that hit to my ego. So I'm just, it's what's a Georgian mob cap? A lot of women in the 18th century, instead of wearing a sort of a, a hard hat, mm. they'd wear like, it was just a bit like a frilly bonnet. Okay. And it was quite large and, and sort of, it's almost what you would imagine a stereotypical maid to be wearing in a, an old fashioned sort of uh, play. Yeah. Where they've yeah. got that sort of white frilly round cap. Yeah, with the apron. Yeah, and I, I just, I know it would destroy me oh. if anyone said that, so I'm, I'm keeping quiet about that. God bless you, that is... <laughs> oh! The thing is, it's still good, it's just not what you wanted it to be. Yeah. You know, f forgive it, forgive the hat for its, its sins. It's still a functional hat. Yeah, it'll be good for something. It's just, so I worry that I'm quite an undignified person as it is. And there's a sort of line, if I wear something that looks too undignified and too cartoonish and too wacky, 
then I, I just feel like that's too much. I, ca- that's, I can't stand it. I'm sorry. Hold on. This entire time, I've had to pretend like I understood what Edwardian, Georgian, and Tudor style <laughs> things are. Oh. You are able to talk about them flawlessly, <laughs> and you're worried that you're undignified? <laughs> I feel like a clown that has walked into, like, some sort of, like, I don't, like, some sort of lecture by someone who's just like, oh, yes, I am, you know, fancy Miss Fancy Pants, and I know all all the things that I I so I so by hand and I like drink a uh, dignified tea with crumpets or whatever the f- crumpets are supposed to be. I don't know. I still don't know what crumpets are. Oh no, I really do. I really do. <laughs> you are the most dignified person I've ever met. The most dignified. I am here with my clown shoes on. <laughs> okay. So a crumpet is a bread product. Okay. It's like a round... It's not a bread product. It's... <laughs> See, only a dignified person can say, no, you got it wrong. It's not a bread product. Here's what it actually is. What is it if it's not bread? It's a rubbery sort of pancake with holes in it. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to pretend like that makes sense to me. I'm, I'm going to pretend like that's not the most British thing I've ever heard. <laughs> it's a round piece of dough with like little pock marks in it and you make it with lots of butter yeah yeah okay <laughs> we can move on it's okay. okay the crumpet is not the point of the podcast right now it is now i'm very sorry <laughs> this is our crafting and crumpets welcome <laughs> however crumpet is also old-timey slang for like a, a hot girl <laughs> Like, what? There's like a nice bit of crumpet over there. Okay, actually, no, that does sound about right. I can, I can sort of, I can see that. I can, like, that does make sense. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're like oh a creepy man from the 70s, you will like look at a, a pretty woman and say she's a nice bit of crumpet. Oh my God. Or, or you'll say, oh, what a bit of crumpet on the side or something like that. <laughs> anyway. Oh my God. What about you, Reese? Oh, God. Okay, jeez. What's, like, the worst thing you've made? God. Yeah, we're going, we're going, sliding right back to circus mode over here. Oh, no, Um, please. Because, I mean, the worst things I've ever made have been all, like, cosplay related. And for, like, I mean, because that's what I sew for, you know? I sew for cosplay. Like, that's, like, my thing. So it was definitely supposed to be like another crop top piece. Mm. But the way I was trying to do it was I had a like a regular pattern shirt that I was going to work off of, but also kind of mix it in with like this crop hoodie. Mm. What I where I f***ed up at, though, was I forgot that the cropped hoodie included like the ribbed piece. And so I didn't lengthen the fabric all the way. And so this thing ended up barely fitting over my boobs. It was it was terrible. I like I, I was so excited. I was like, oh, I'm going to you know, post pictures and everything. And I looked at myself in the mirror and I was just like, we never speak of this again. <laughs> and here I am on a podcast speaking of it. So there's if that. If you want, it's... you can choose something else and we can, we nope, can pretend nope, you never spoke fine. of it. Okay. <laughs> It was it was terrible. Do you destroy your failures? I, actually, no. So I had I have one of those little I don't know like sewing things that like you can take apart this. So what I did mm. was I I literally unstitched the whole thing, and I only took I only kept the parts that are still good for something. So like the parts that was like obviously not fitting me, I was like you're you're one in the trash. We never. I'm not even gonna look at you. But I kept the sleeves because the sleeves are still fine. I kept like the collar like that was still fine. It was more like. You know the actual body the area, torso. and I was just like, yeah. "We got it. We got to throw you out. You're not this. This is not what I thought we, this was going to happen." Oh, so that's what I do. I, I at least try to keep the things that are working, and I just throw away the things that aren't. You know what? That's a decent philosophy. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Keep the things that work. Ditch the things that won't. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because some of my real failures, I just haven't spoken of them because they no longer exist. Ah, I see. That's fair. You know what? I will also expose myself. Now, again, I don't craft. This is another example of why I should never do anything with my hands apart from maybe cooking, right? When I had a different laptop, like maybe five or six years ago now. So I I read about how, oh, 
you know, laptops can get a lot of dust in them and it can cause lots of problems. But what you can do is you can like get some pressurized air and like blow it in the inside of the laptop and that'll help clear the dust out. And I was like, huh, maybe I should do that because I've had this laptop for a really long time. And then I was like, but I shouldn't just put the air straight into it because it won't have anywhere to go. So what I should do is kind of see if I can get the top of the laptop off, like take all the keyboard bit off. And so maybe if I just unscrew it here and unscrew it there. Actually, no, that seems to be going badly. Let me watch a YouTube video on how to do this. Oh, okay. That looks easy. And so if I just, un- oh, the hinges, oh, the, the whole screen has come off. Oh, I see. Oh, this seems to, oh, I have to take this to a computer doctor now. By the way, just as an extra bit of spice, I attempted to do this at my boyfriend at the time's house. I started doing it at 7 PM and we were meant to be at a comedy night at 8 PM. <laughs> And I was like, this would be just an easy, quick fix. Everyone on the internet says it's fine. (laughs) Everyone on the internet says it's fine. See, that's when you shouldn't listen. I know. (laughs) Oh my God. So I took it to a computer doctor and and spent like at least a hundred quid on getting them to reattach the laptop screen and re-screw in everything. Then I and I just I just was like, I don't know what to tell you. (laughs) (laughs) You're fair enough. We are starting to come to the end of the episode. So I've got one more thing to round us off on. Big, big question this. So as you mentioned earlier, Jess, crafting is extremely expensive and labor intensive. But if you had infinite time and infinite money, what would you make? Ooh, I think I would make an 18th century riding habit. Oh. And there's a particular style which is really beautiful, which is a lot of women's clothes throughout history have actually been modelled on men's clothes, Mm. but they just have a different silhouette. And there's a particular style of 18th century riding habit, and it's got the long flowing skirt, but the jacket is like a men's military jacket, but very tailored. And it's got sort of the frogging and the brass buttons and the embroidered bits, and it's just... I just find it so stylish and I'd have a matching hat. Of course. The only thing I can't make is shoes, which is very upsetting to me, (laughs) but yeah. And I think I'd probably make it in a russet. Mm. Yeah, a russet, an orangey russet, yeah. Lovely. Do you know what? I was imagining something orangey russet in my head as you were talking. Synergy. Yes. (laughs) Reese, if you had infinite time, and infinite money, what would you make? I would get into pottery. Pottery is something that I've always wanted to get into. Again, this is like undiagnosed ADHD happening again. (laughs) It's just, it's, it's like, it would be my newest obsession. It's, it's something that I think about a lot. Mm. I've even like tried going online to see like, oh, how much does a kiln cost? And like, like, oh, what if I could swing money that way? Could I like really like, do some pottery stuff. I don't know if I ever will, but it's it's always been something that's like on my bucket list, you know? Wow. Yeah. Oh, you can get really good kilns and, and wheels and things secondhand because they're so clunky that people are just begging to get rid of them <laughs> if they don't need them anymore. Oh, I need to look for those. Yeah. My mom used to be a professional potter. She's like a, a proper artist, which is probably where I learned everything I know. Wow. But we had like a potter's wheel and a kiln in our garden. And when I was a teenager, she taught me how to make pots. Mm. It's surprisingly, well, it's not surprisingly easy, but it's, again, there's no magic formula. It's Mm. just sort of... Repetition and... Anyone can do it. Yeah. Mm. Repetition and pressing with your thumbs. Yes. Yeah. I made (laughs) a couple of ancient Greek style craters, which is an ancient Greek sort of drinking cup. Oh, well, it was the calyx. Well, anyway, and with sort of uh, red figure images around the outside. Ooh. But it was really good fun. That's so cool. So I'd recommend it, basically. It, it's <laughs> just really mesmerising, just staring at the spiralling wheel. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, as we stare into the spiralling wheel of our time on this episode it stops and it's just finished and it's just time to go 
Thank you both so much for coming on this episode. This has been so much fun. I was worried that it like it might not be because I don't know any, anything about crafting, but it was actually really good. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. Oh, it's amazing. And you are both incredibly talented people. Thank you so much. Listener, thank you for listening along. And I'll see you on the next episode. You've both been wonderful guests. And we shall see you anon. <laughs> Enthusiasm is a podcast distributed by Rusty Quill and licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share-Alike 4.0 International License. It is directed by Helen Gould, produced by Lori Ann Davis, with executive producers Alexander J. Newell and April Sumner, and edited by Marissa Ewing, Tessa Broom, and Catherine Minella. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.